I remember how I'm supposed to start with something harmless. I've been studying stand-up for maybe the past six months because I was like, oh, this is something I think I might be good at in some kind of very weird stoner way. So people generally start with something like, my dog is so spoiled. If people knew that this rescue, and yes, for the people who are wondering, I am virtue signaling right now. <laughs> um, this dog, who granted, when we got her, was, you know, kind of Santa, Santa's little helper from The Simpsons, but was anorexia. Um, we've loved her, she's come around, and now she is super spoiled. She is so spoiled that she gets spring water from Vermont in her water dish. Because I, the bitch in the house, am so spoiled that I get them too. So the water thing has a hot and a cold. And I like to give her this much cold and then just a little bit of hot on the top, you know? <laughs> Not just like, hey dog, here's some cold water. I know you like licking out of the toilet, but you know, this is spring water from Vermont. Now the Vermont part is important because I moved to New Hampshire for the Free State Project, which is a geopolitical movement to concentrate a whole bunch of people in the live free or die state of New Hampshire. But I get my spring water from Vermont. <laughs> Why, you ask? Because New Hampshire is actually so small towny and ancient that when I moved here eight and a half to nine years ago, there was no one in New Hampshire who had a website who was selling spring water. <laughs> so I had to buy it from a company in Vermont and they generously drive down and they bring me my water, which I then get to give to my dog. <laughs> so about this Free State Project thing. So I signed up, you know, it's this kind of deal where you have to sign up, and it took um, the organization about 15 years to get 20,000 people to sign up to say they were gonna move to New Hampshire. I signed up in about 2003, I moved to New Hampshire in 2008 and kind of got roped in. Now I have to admit, when I moved here, I was a little skeptical. So you hear about this community and you hear about these people and we're all gonna live up in New Hampshire and we're gonna live free or die, but rather not the latter. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, did I join a cult? <laughs> And so being the person I am, I was like, hold on, I need to research this. So I did a lot of research, as I want to do, and I was like, no, you know, for a cult you need X, Y, and Z. You definitely need a charismatic leader, and I was like, well, we don't have one of those, we're good enough. <laughs> of um, organizing something for this organization one time and I don't know I guess people kind of like me and they were like oh we found a charismatic leader so so I, 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 I mean I didn't start the cult but I certainly made it work. <laughs> so, in my duties as the cult leader of the Free State Project, the parts of the job that I really enjoyed was trying to find people across the world, across the globe, across the country, across the fucking street, <laughs> to listen to the ideas we have and to understand that there really is something fundamental and interesting about assuming that every person is a sovereign being and that every person should be able to decide for themselves what they're going to do with their lives as long as they harm no one else. 
And that's a legitimate conversation that we should be having every day with every person. So the reporters, thank you. <laughs> so the reporters would call up. And what do most people know about libertarians, right? They're, they're sort of white. Like, they're yeah. white. They're male. <laughs> they're male. They live in basements. They live in basements. They're rich. They're rich. Selfish. They like guns. They hate roads. They, use they hate roads. <laughs> they, they smoke weed. Bitcoin. They smoke weed. All right, let me see if I can break that down. So, so this New York Times reporter, first of all, is like, really obsessed with the whole gun part of things. And this was right before we triggered the move in 2016 on Porcupine Day. Yes, he goes, triggered, huh? So are you guys calling for violent revolution? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, what do you mean with the word triggered? And I'm like, um, I don't really know, but I, I, I mean, I have an MFA, I have a master's in English, and you're a reporter for the New York Times. So how about we do this? Why don't you come up with an active verb that explains something that hasn't happened yet, but is about to happen, and I'll give you some time. And I just sat on the phone, after about 30 seconds, he goes, all right, triggered is a really good <laughs> verb. <laughs> but still, you're a bunch of white male gun nuts. <laughs> so I said, all right, let's break this part down. I was born and raised in South Africa. I'm an American citizen. What does that make me? <laughs> Tick tock, tick tock. He's going trigger, 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 trigger. It's like, well, I guess arguably you could say you're African American. I'm like, and can you tell from my voice that I'm not a man? Yes. So I'm an African American woman who happens to like guns who's running a cult in New Hampshire, <laughs> first in the primary. <laughs> and, you know, so please stop insulting me that way. <laughs> and, you know, the, the article, as is typically the case, was kind of a hatchet job, but, you know, you know they're listening, they're out there, and they're trying. So having grown up in South Africa, I do think about race probably more than the average person. And I do actually self-identify as African-American. I think words are important. I was born in Africa. I became an American citizen. Yes, I'm white. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a little bit, like I got a little bit of Africa in me. But not as much as I wanted. <laughs> so I got my 23andMe results today. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, God. And, um, you know, I've, I'd always been told by my parents, you know, we're Dutch, we're French, we're sort of, and fair enough, we were definitely from Europe. But I was also like, hey, we're kind of fuck you people who left Europe in the 1800s, got on a fucking boat, was like, fuck you guys! Yeah, we'll get on this boat, we'll go to another country, and we'll see how that works out. <laughs> so apparently for my people, not as much like white black fucking as I would have preferred. <laughs> but I am 31.8% British Irish, which since it is St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> I think I should take a swig of wine. <laughs> should be whiskey, We're but... Well, someone get me a whiskey. Yeah. Irish drink, yes. <laughs> All right, I'm also a part French German. Oh, I wrote the real numbers down somewhere, but this is the other test card. I'm also a Laplandish Scandinavian, which I like to say, fuck you, I'm Viking. <laughs> and then, I have a little 
more Neanderthal in me than the average person. <laughs> so I have 70% more Neanderthal than average people. And I think I'm gonna wear that with some pride. I feel like, you know what? The fuck, we come from monkeys and I still know where my roots are. <laughs> But the real disappointment is because <laughs> the people who know me pretty well know I like to sometimes drop words that, you know, are not necessarily palatable if you are a white person. But when you're a person who, and we'll come up with the definitions together. So I have a friend, she used to lawyer with me back in the day in San Francisco. She was half Japanese and half Texan. And that's how she would explain it. She wouldn't say she was half American <laughs> and half Japanese. She was half Japanese, half Texan. She was six foot tall. She was gorgeous, tall, slim. She could have modeled. Her face was Asian, but she didn't have the drinking gene, which meant she could drink. And she talked like a Texan. This girl was awesome. And it was the first time outside South Africa that I'd ever heard what I don't even regard as a racial slur, but she was like, oh, Carla, people call me a banana. And I was like, a banana? Like, what's that? And she was like, I'm yellow on the outside and white on the inside. <laughs> Apparently these days they call those Twinkies, but back then it was a banana. <laughs> Then, I guess, I don't know, I did a little bit of research, I watched some comedy, so uh, black people, black girls, I don't know if it's that specific, who are <laughs> black on the outside but white on the inside are called Oreos. Uh. So then I was like, holy shit, I'm a white African American anarchist libertarian living in New Hampshire, and I was like, well, what would that make me? And I was like, oh, I don't know, like, an eclair? No, <laughs> that's the wrong way around. How about a Milano, right? Those are those pepper, those cookies, right? With the sort of vanilla and then the chocolate on the inside. And I was like, no. Maybe I'm a chocolate-covered raisin. Like, there's got to be a little hippie in there. <laughs> But then I started thinking, and I was like, huh, what else is sort of white on the outside and black on the inside? And I was like, hmm, prisons. The military. Washington, D.C. The, Louis told me not to do this part. The <laughs> Illuminati. <laughs> Oh. oh, I lost the order of my cards. So I'm gonna go with this. Knock, knock. Who's there? Yeah. I'm in. Who's there? So Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Exactly. The effect I was going for. So for no one who understands that joke, the Mandela effect apparently is something that people here sort of, I don't know if I would say suffer under, that seems a little strong, but people sort of of a certain age remember Nelson Mandela dying, except he didn't die, he just got freed from jail. But I suspect what actually happened is there was a other leader of the resistance in South Africa whose name was Chris Hani who died around the time that Nelson Mandela came out and things were happening and America stopped paying attention because they were like, we don't really need to use Nelson Mandela as a distractory thing anymore. I think we can go invade Nicaragua maybe, or you know, <laughs> maybe Gulf War I. And um, so Chris Hani, when he passed away, we all knew, and, and South Africans, by the way, do not suffer from the Mandela effect. <laughs> but we do have a joke about Chris Hani, who was a member of the African National Congress with Mandela, 
Um, and you know, they were a resistance movement. Uh, they were actual textbook communists. They, for a long time, uh, talked about how we can peacefully resist. And then at some stage, they were like, yeah, you know what, we're actually going to start blowing some shit up. We're not going to kill anyone, but, you know, power plants are fair game or whatever. And this is something, you know, that people sort of gloss over. America even glossed over, right? And so when Chris Haney died, we would say, we are now the land of milk and no honey. Yeah. <laughs>